Now, if you just can't get enough of models, you can go to the RFCs and pick up 1122 and 1123, and they'll tell you all you wanted to know about the TCP IP model. And again, just like the OSI model, the rules and procedures and how the operation should go are all listed in these particular RFCs. One big difference between RFCs 1122 and 1123 and X.200 is that the RFCs do specify the protocols to be used on the TCP IP model. Specifically, they're the protocols that come from the other RFCs, and again, we'll talk about these later on. Now, the image on this particular slide shows a mapping between the two models. And as we can see, the upper three layers of the OSI model map straight across to the application layer of the TCP IP model. The next five slides are going to get a little busy, but it's difficult to describe all the features and functions that each layer possesses without writing an awful lot of text. Starting at the top, we have the application layer. And as you've probably guessed, this is the actual interface with the user. So you're trying to format user data and handle the processing in preparation for getting the data out on the network. Common applications for users include FTP, gaming, email, and of course web browsing. But there are an awful lot of other applications that run on the network such as Telnet, DNS, and things of that sort. The next layer down is the transport layer or what we call layer four. Now I've listed a whole bunch of things here, but we're going to talk about a couple of significant details. The first up is the fact that there are actually two major protocols that exist at layer four. TCP, or Transmission Control Protocol, and UDP, or User Datagram Protocol. As you've guessed, this model gets its name from TCP, at least in part. The significant difference between the two protocols is how they operate. TCP is what we call connection oriented. So it is very concerned with making sure that the packets get from the source to the destination properly. To that end, TCP includes sequence numbers. Now UDP is far less concerned with sequence numbers. In fact, it is called connection less because if we lose a UDP packet, we don't really care. When developers build applications, they build them to either be a TCP or a UDP based product. And so TCP and UDP have direct hooks into the operating system and the applications. Common TCP applications include FTP and HTTP. Most of your gaming and voice over IP or video over IP are UDP applications or at least UDP streams. The last thing I'll mention about this particular layer is the addressing. A lot of layers have a very particular kind of addressing and what we use at layer four. Moving down to layer three, we have the internet or internetwork layer. The name is significant because this layer is what we actually use to get in between networks. Every host and every device on the network has an IP address which you're probably all familiar with. Included at this layer are a couple of sub protocols including ICMP and IGMP. Now IP is called best effort because it really doesn't have anything to do with ensuring traffic gets from one place to another. We use it for routing and for handling packets but we leave some of the handling up to TCP and UDP from the layers above. A couple of other important functions that happen here at layer 3 are quality of service and fragmentation. IP has the ability to chop up large data chunks into smaller pieces and then reassemble them at the other end. Local area network protocols such as Ethernet and 802.11 live down here at the link layer. Now this layer 2 actually has a whole bunch of jobs to do and is actually considered our connection to the network itself. Now the list shown comes from the standard but maybe it's a little easier to think of it as the actual connection. 
Now that said, there are actually two sublayers. One is called logical link control. Logical link control is largely there to form the frame itself. So addressing error control and filling in the fields. Media access control is there for governing what we call line discipline or things like whose turn is it to talk on the network. Network nodes take turns transmitting frames and this is governed by access methods such as carrier sense multiple access with collision detection used in Ethernet. All of these requirements are actually built into the network interface card for your computer. At the very bottom of our model we have the physical layer. Now this is actually also part of your network interface card but has a little different focus. When you take a look at the shape of the connector whether it's RJ45 or RJ11 coax and then the electrical characteristics such as the power levels and the voltage these are part of the physical layer concerns. Encoding uh, such as Manchester or NRZI the shape of the waveform these are also parts of the physical layer. For the most part physical layer decisions are made for you. It's not very often that you get to pick the shape of the connector the electrical signals or what type of encoding you're going to use. However, it's worth noting that these things are occasionally automatically negotiated between pieces of equipment. So for example, a switch and a network interface card may negotiate speed or in some cases the encoding type. On this slide we see a couple of packets that were captured via Wireshark. Now Wireshark represents data in the exact opposite fashion that our model diagrams do. So layer 2 is actually on the top here. Wireshark also does not show us layer 1. Now one of the other important details that we can see from these packets is what we call the encapsulation. So working from Ethernet type 2 there we can see that Ethernet type 2 encapsulates IP and in the case of the top packet user datagram protocol is encapsulated followed by RTP. Now on the bottom one we have a TCP packet. Now when we say encapsulated that means that the upper protocol is inside the next one down. So if we use the bottom example HTTP is inside TCP which is inside IP which is inside Ethernet. These packets also give us a chance to see the addressing that is used at the different layers. So we see MAC addresses, IP addresses, and port numbers. Okay, just to recap a little bit here, understanding the models helps us wrap our brains around how transmissions actually work. We see all the protocols and their interrelated nature, and of course now we see how user data is actually encapsulated in many different protocols. But we also get a handle on all of the different types of addressing used. And of course we have all the equipment that's used to handle all this network traffic. If you didn't understand how it all went together, it might be very difficult to handle security, quality of service, or troubleshoot problems. We'll use this last figure to put together some of the ideas we've talked about. On the left hand side we have a TCP IP based node, and on the right we have another. Now they're interconnected via a small network. As you can see, the network is comprised of a couple of different types of devices, and each one of these devices operates at a different layer, which means that they process packets or frames and are concerned with different layers of addressing. So, for example, switches are concerned with MAC addresses and routers are concerned with IP addresses. On the right-hand side, I've included a couple of protocols that are filled in at the various layers. And so this diagram is just another way of looking at things. All right, so what have we been talking about? Models are the architecture that we really use to form transmissions. It really doesn't matter what kind of transmission you're dealing with. Somewhere there's a model that handles everything. Now the protocols and the different equipment types and addressing all fit into the layers. Each layer has its own features and functions associated with it. Most of the time models wind up in theoretical discussions, but they do have their practical side. If you understand models, you have a better handle on addressing, packets, frames, and protocols. Hey, and who knows? 
Learn a lot about models and you might turn into a network ninja. Thanks for listening to this networking podcast. I hope that you found it helpful. I also hope to see you at the next one in the series. If you have comments or questions, you can email me at bruce.hartpence at rit.edu or visit www.nssa.rit.edu. Thanks again, and may your packets always reach their destinations.